the dumpster diving end of power amplifiers than, um, than the sort of first hand, hand design. So um, I was fortunate enough to get given some interesting looking power amplifiers um, that worked at, at 1960 megs. And uh, I thought, this is a challenge. I've got to be able to do something with these. Uh, not much of what I'm doing is new. Um, it's, um, it's been done before. Uh, but um, I just want to try and get across the idea that it is possible to do these things. Uh, I, I mean, a lot of the old bi bipolar amplifiers pe people have modified. But it is possible to do this with LDMOS as well, with a reasonable bit of skill. So... Um, these amplifiers I'm talking about, they're ex-cellular amplifiers. One of the things about the cellular industry is they're very conscious of how much it costs them. And I read somewhere that, that, that the Vodafone network in the UK requires the equivalent of a small nuclear power station to run its base stations. So a few years ago, people started ripping out very inefficient amplifiers and replacing them with high-efficiency amps um, of the type that um, you'll, you'll see now. Uh, th that meant that a lot of these things became available on eBay and places like that um, in the not quite the right sort of band, but a useful sort of band. And the amplifiers I, I've looked at, there's two basic types. There's ones that operate around about 1960 and ones that operate around about uh, 2100. Now, when you look at the specs for these, it says they're 30-watt amplifiers, but they're actually 30 watts per carrier and they take multiple carriers. So something like a CDMA amp has the device capability, the silicon, to do probably over 200 watts under the right conditions. So as amateurs, we can run these at high power. We can run them in CW. Or we can run them in linear mode. And we're not bothered so much about what our electricity bill is because it's small compared to somebody like Vodafone. So... There was a series of amplifiers that all have generic names like ILAM, IPAM, PKLAM, and P2PAM. And a lot of the inside of them are built by the Andrew Corporation, um, who are famous for the squiggly lines on dishes. Um, they are... Um, there's also some... Like this, this one, this picture's done by JRC. And a lot of them, it's, they look identical outside, and you open the lids, and they're different inside despite the fact they have the same name. So there's lots of these about. And the thing that got me interested in this was a long time ago, um, Paul Marsh, I don't know if Paul's here, gave me an amplifier um, at, at Martlesham one day and said, you can do, do something with that. And I found a paper by a guy called R.L. Frey, W-A-W, who'd bought, who'd done some 1960 megahertz amplifier mods, and I thought, that's clever. He stretched these to 13 cents. Oh, I bet I could do that. So, um, what we've got, what, what I've looked at both 1960 and 2100, quite frankly, 2120 amplifiers are too easy. Most of them will work with a few, a bit of simple retuning. They'll work at 2320. You fix the bias up, provide yourself a PTT line, and, and uh, away you go. But I wanted to try, because many years ago I used to design RF amplifiers. Uh, power amplifiers, I wanted to try... Oops, sorry, wrong button. Um, I wanted to try moving the basic RF design from 1.9 to 2.3, and that's just a challenge. And because I've not got fancy things for measuring device parameters, the only way I can do it is to cut and try. Um, and I have a thing that some of you have seen my talks before will know I have a thing that I call the Bodger's subroutine, which is... Make an intelligent stab at what, what you want, what, what you think might work when you're modifying something. Have a guess. Then, build it, cut it, fiddle about with it until it works. Now, the professional engineers here will be going, oh, no, we all have CAD and things. But if you've not got the access to a lot of that stuff, you can do a lot of things by cutting and trying, uh, especially if you have a load of amplifiers that came out of a dumpster that didn't cost you anything. I do not recommend this approach probably for expensive devices, but I found I can usually get something to work if I try hard enough. So, and uh, bodger is just an English term for uh, a job that's sort of done reasonably well, but, um, but not very professionally. But, so I don't claim to be a, be, be, be a professional engineer on these things. So 
let's have a look at the different sorts of topologies. What, what shapes of amplifiers have you got? The to, in general, oops, I keep pressing the wrong button. In general terms, you've got amplifiers which have a load of individual pallets with devices on them, all combined, like this one. This is one of the this is one of the PK lambs, I believe. And then you've got what I like to call an all-in-one amplifier, where you've got a single PCB, and everything, all the devices, the combiners, and everything are on the same same PCB. Now, Hanzu who Hanzu who knows why that approach is now being being replaced by this approach. It's cheaper. So you'll find the older the amplifiers are, the more you're likely to get these ones with individual devices that plug in. So the first thing to do is open up the box and see what sort of amp amplifier you've got. Um, can somebody answer that idiot? <laughs> right, OK. Um, <laughs> so if you look at what's actually what, what the circuit designs are like in these, most of these are multiple device um, amplifiers. And you've got various types. The most common is a pair of amplifiers in the middle there with a pair of 90-degree hybrids, which, pro which, which provide two signals 90 degrees out of phase. And you recombine the outputs after the amplification, and you get something like double the power. And the other advantage is, because if any of these amplifiers are slightly mismatched, all that will happen is you'll dissipate a little bit more power in these loads and your actual circuit match will be still be quite good. So that's the simplest type of thing you'll see. A pair of devices. I'm sure you've all seen those and build those. Um, I've seen quite a few with three output devices that use basically the same idea. But they use... They, they take the input there, they split it one-third, two-thirds with a 5 dB coupler, then they take the two-thirds and split it into two one-thirds. So, so you end up with each amplifier taking one-third of the input power, all in quadrature, all 90 degrees away, and you do the whole thing in reverse. So you don't have to have even numbers of devices to, to combine them. And the previous picture, that one, is a, good, is a good example of one of the ones with three devices in it. It uses 5 dB and 3 dB couplers. Um, so... That's uh, two of the topologies you will come across with these surplus amplifiers. Then, you can obviously take the two in, into two and just keep on repeating it in pairs. That's four devices, which is basically two identical twins. You could take two three-device amplifiers and combine them and get six and so on. And this one, which came across me as a surprise recently, these are, this type of design is the sort of thing that's now been used in the high-efficiency amplifiers. This is known as a Doherty configuration, or Doherty, I'm, I'm never sure which. Um, similar idea at the beginning, you provide two, two signals 90 degrees out of phase. This amplifier is biased in, in linear mode, class AB, and this one is biased in class, basically biased off in class C. So what happens is the carrier amplifier does most of the work at low power and is nice and linear. But on the peaks of the input signals, this one takes over and, and does, the, does the other bit of the amplification. And this one doesn't have to be linear. So what you end up then is that one taking all the, doing all the work at low levels and this one dealing with the peaks. And what, what you do with those is you simply put the two outputs in parallel... That gives you a 25 ohms, and then you transform it back up to 50 ohms with a quarter wave transformer. So I'm beginning to see these things appearing in surplus as well. So um, there's, there's four, at least four configurations you might come across. But they're all basically the same. They've all got inside there a single amplifier which is matched to something at the input and something at uh, the output. So the job of, of changing the banding of these is to get the basic amplifier blocks and modifying those so that they work on your new frequency, and then making sure your combiners work on that frequency as well. And if you can do that, you, you can modify the whole amplifier. So which ones should I attempt to modify? Well, it's relatively easy to rematch the 1900 MHz devices, but the couplers and the hybrids often have poor performance 400 MHz away. So, then the big advantage of a pallet amplifier, where you've got each individual device on one block, and it's a 50-ohm in-out block, 
is that you can work on it separately, get that working so that you know it's working properly, then measure the hybrids, see how good they are, and if they're good enough, keep them. If they're not, throw them away and put your own hybrids in and just recombine. So um, it's really a two-stage thing. Get the basic gain block matched and working, then think about doing the combining. Um, I find that when you've got one of these all-in-one amplifiers where everything's on the same PCB, you've got too many variables to do it all at once. So you've got a choice, really. It becomes almost impossible to do one of these amplifiers all in one go. Um, so <laughs> two things. You can take the cop out and just avoid am amplifiers like that or take the approach of Mr. Frey, who basically split the amplifier apart, chopped, chopped them apart on the, on the PCB, you know, with a scalpel and what have you, match each one and, re and reconnect it back Back, back together again. But the mechanics of that is a little bit more difficult than if you've just got a nice, simple pallet. But, but if you do happen to do that, you can either use it, half the amplifier as a low-power amplifier, or you can recombine them with your own combiners. So it's quite a few, a few approaches to make there. So you've got one of these. Somebody hands you a, a large metal heat sink with lots of connectors on. So you spend a week working out what all the connections are. Once you've done that, you can power the thing up and just see, because most of these are designed to run 28 volts or 40, 48 volts. So you can run the thing up as it stands and see what happens. In most cases, the amplifiers will go, oh, and then shut down. Because they're surrounded by computers that tell them to come on and off. And all sorts of sensors and all sorts, sorts, sorts of things. And you can see this happening just... Power the thing up, look at the gate voltages, and you'll see the gate voltages on the, on the devices come up, the amplifier then decides there's nothing there and they shut down again. So what you have to do is the first thing to do with any of this is either if you're clever with microprocessors or clever with, with, with digital stuff, and I'm not really, um, is you can jerry-rig the processor thing to keep the bias on them permanently. Or you, you can use Mr. Dave's approach of just ripping out, out the control thing and building your own bias circuit and just biasing the devices separately. So, so once you've sort of run the amplifier up, have a look at the existing design. Try and get a handle on what the existing design looks like. And you can, you can measure all the microstrip lines, lines with a vernier caliper. You can, um, you can work out the impedances and you can model the thing roughly and see where the original design is going. The, the advantage of that is it allows you to play with the matching networks a bit before you start cutting copper and, uh, and doing things. And I've got half-decent models of these things at their original frequency, and then you can tweak them on a computer. Then, bias the amplifiers up, and that's basically a direct connection to your 28-volt supply via the, uh, to, to the drain with a fuse and protection. A simple regulated gate supply and bias the tr uh, transistors up so that so the quiescent current is as per the da data sheets for that device. So what, what you've got at this point is an amplifier that's active, but it's still not modified. So then you get, then you get your, test, your uh, tuning setup, and the basic sort of test setup is a signal generator, an amplifier to drive it, a through line, a matching stub, which is this thing. If you see these on eBay, get them. And... <laughs> The, the amplifier, an attenuator, and a power meter. So what I do first is I normally bring the thing, things, things up on their working frequency, start with low drive. Some of these only need milliwatts to drive them. Um, and just ascertain the thing is actually working as it was intended to do. Now you've got it biased up. Um, then what I then do is... If you take, for example, one of the pallets, as Charlie said this morning, you, you want to tune the output circuit up first. So what I do is I get the amplifier as a whole, put a, stub, put a tuning stub on it, match the whole amplifier on the new frequency using the tuning stub. And the reason for that is to get the power into it in the first place. Then you look at the output stage and you try and rematch the output stage for the output power at your final frequency. Once you're happy with the output stage, you can then get rid of the tuning stub and go back and work on the input stage. So it's a sort of a backwards and forwards thing. But 
it's this thing about too many variables again. If your output's not tuned correctly and your input's not, you've got more to work on. So get rid of one of the variables. Match up, up the amplifier with the stub. If, if, you can't, if you weren't lucky enough to have someone phone you up and say, would you like this? Um, try and you can actually make one, but they're not they're quite they're quite difficult. But that's basically that's basically the procedure I use to get these these going. Match them without touching the amplifier on the input. Just do that for VSWR. Then tune tune the output stage and then go back and rematch the input stage. And there's a thing that I like to call the fat line and capacitor input network. I was glad Charlie used the word fat line this morning. I thought I was going to. I thought I thought of something new. If you look at most S-band 13 sem amplifiers, this is this is one of my 1296 boards I hacked to put one of these devices in. And basically, what they've got is a very low impedance line on the input and a capacitor either in series or in shunt. They're not all like that, but. That's a reasonable, simple matching circuit, and a similar thing on the output. And if you plot some typical impedances on a Smith chart, sharp intake of breath, you see why. Because the, impedance, the device impedances are over here, right at this end of the low impedance end of the chart. And if you get a few ohms of line in, in series, it comes round, round to here, and then you just add a bit of series capacitance to the end there, and you find yourself at 50 ohms. And... All that, all that trimmer does, that, that series capacitor or shunt capacitor, allows you to do some final tweaking so that you get the best S SWR. And, if you, and what this example shows is that's just two quite different impedances, even though they're quite close together. And you see, when the impedance goes from there, it gets a good match. If it changes, you go from a 5-ohm line to a 10-ohm line, just a, fat, a thinner line, and you can get the thing, thing rematched. And the length of that line is somewhere around 0.2 of a wavelength. Okay. Um, so the actual rematching consists of filling around with the size of the input matching circuit. Copper tape and a scalpel is essential for this job. So a change in device impedance, which is what will happen from 1960 to, to 2310, just requires a line width change and a different series, series capacitor. So when you've sat there with bits, bits of copper tape tabbing or snowflake in your amplifier, what, what you're doing is you're just basically altering the input tuning a bit. So that's really the approach. There's nothing clever about it. You just sit there tweaking it until you get a good input match, uh, good output power and efficiency, and then do the same on, on the input. And this is, I found that many of these, these 1960 pallets rematched just by widening and lengthening the, 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 the existing line a bit and uh, just put a series or shunt, shunt trimmer. So you end up with this fat line and capacitor type of thing. Now, if you look very carefully at this mess of copper around here, that's my, that's my modification. Now, if you look at the silver bits with the holes in it, that's actually ground plane. And I actually wanted to widen the line where the ground plane is, but I didn't want to cut the ground plane away. So, and this is really, this is really tacky, but what you can do is you, you, you can stick Kapton tape, which is heat-proof PTFE tape, over the, over the grounded bit and sticky copper tape on, on top of it. So you get a sandwich of, of copper tape and ground plane. I don't recommend you to do that on the output sim simply because of the currents flowing around there. But I, because I tried hacking away this ground plane, but of course all these plated through holes go right through the board. And in the end I found, well, why don't I just cover them up? And I've done that with a, with a few amplifiers. And the trimmer there was originally there on the original circuit and I recycled it to go on to just give me an input match. And the output match, surprisingly enough, didn't need anything doing to it apart from retuning. So, basically, you just interactively adjust the width and length of this, this fat line until you get a dip in the VSWR. Then you know you've got the power into it, and, you, and you've already done your output stage, because if you remember, I matched this with a stub before I started and did the output stage. So, it's not rocket science, and it's fairly crude, but it does work. Now, a word about combiners and isolators. 
most of these amplifiers have isolators on the output and they use these little strip line combiners like this. The problem is with isolators is that when you change their frequency, they lose directivity. What that means is you've got power dissipated in its, in its load. So, of course, up goes, goes the power and up goes the loss. And it's often better to just bypass the isolator and fit an external one for, for the right band. Especially if you want to run JT modes, because these isolators will cope with it, but they do begin to get a bit hot, and um, so you have to be a little careful. With combiners, the situation is even worse. It's not just loss, because what happens with combiners when you, when you move them out of frequency range is the phase and the amplitude match begins to go. The two signals are no longer in quadrature. They're no longer at the same level. So you end up um, getting um, higher losses, reduced power. And in extremis, if the, if the thing is not rated, I, I, don't, I don't know how clear this is, but this is one that exploded. Can you see that black thing? That blew out of there like a flash from a shotgun. And it blew the whole, whole thing out. So that's what happens if you run 100-watt combiners at 250 watts for more than a few seconds. So look up the spec of the combiners. It's, it's all written on the front. Some of them are 200-watt watt rated, and they, you can just about get away with it with those. But the 100-watt ones don't like it up them, as they used to say in a comedy program. So you, they can fail in quite a spectacular fashion. Now, amazingly enough, the devices survived that. So they are quite robust devices, and you have to be, well, no, I won't say it because it'll mean that I'm an idiot to blow them up. They are quite difficult, difficult to blow up, but you can blow them up. Two things blow them up, too much drive and too much gate voltage. They're the main things. So you may find you have to change the output uh, combiner, but there are some 13 SEM 250-watt rated combiners, or 200-watt rated, and I've used those comfortably at 270 watts for a long time. So there's just some of the pit, pit, pitfalls to look at once you've done the basic amplifier. Thermal considerations as well. Um, these amplifiers, the problem with taking internally matched devices and stretching them is the efficiency goes. And you often end up with an overall efficiency of less than 40%. Put that into, put, put that into um, the context that these amplifiers were designed to go in a rack with forced air cooling when they're running properly, they do get extremely hot extremely quickly. So you've got to really force air cool them. And, and, and I use two fans with Paul's wonderful controller board. So as soon as it starts to get hot, um, the thing speeds up. And um, I, that might be overkill, but um, the trouble is the efficiency does go on these amplifiers. I didn't say this was going to be uh, leading edge stuff, it's getting power on 13 SEMs. So if you, if you have a word with Roger, PMK, he's actually got this amplifier now. So and if you want to look at one in, li in, in, in real life, he might show you it if you ask him nicely. So you've got to watch the thermal side, side of it as well. So some examples and results. This is these, oh, sorry. This is one of the P2PAM. Uh, this is two pallets, one modified in a slightly different way to the other one you saw, because again, it came out of the same amplifier, but a slightly different um, uh, layout, and that's an unmodified one. So it's simply a case of moving the capacitor there, adding a bit of copper tab, and it worked. Great. And there are four of these in the raffle, four of these amplifiers, and they do the best part of 100 watts, each, each pallet. So this is, this, is just, this, this is a conservative view. I was getting something like, 13 dB gain, 65, 75 watts, quite comfortably on 2320 from a 100 and 130 watt device. So you, you do lose, lose a bit of power, but it's an awful lot, lot cheaper than buying a DB6NT amplifier. And you can sort of tune them so they're in the center of the band. I've never managed to make one work at 2400. It's just a step too far, I think. But reasonable efficiency, reasonable gain, and you've got a very cheap amplifier. Um, this was a very easy one. This is, because I'm conscious of time, so I'll speed on. This, this was one of the Doherty amps. Um, you can see the, the two devices and the combining and the, and the uh, transformer on there and the isolator and a whole load of pre-driver stages. This was easy. I didn't do any RF mods to this. I just <coughs> fitted... Um, in fact, this even had 
the bias pots fitted for uh, testing. So I just connected up the bias pots there, discovered this point that you could enable you to disable it, powered it up, and I got 100 watts out of it. I've not even tried to tune it. The devices are capable of actually more than that. And there's one of these in the raffle as well. Okay. So a quick do's and don'ts. Um, you've got to watch the forced air cooling. They, they need a much bigger heat sink than you might imagine in C, CW mode. When you're doing your tweaking, try and avoid using shunt capacitors on the output because they take lots of current and get hot. And, tr and don't use trimmers if you, can, if you can avoid it because they tend to glow. So watch the output capacitors ratings. And most of all, don't apply too much gate bias or drive. Because if you overdrive the gates with either bias or drive, they're gone. And they're soldered down to a heat sink this size, and they're a de devil to get off to change. So it's only meant to be a, across the treetops. There's a few more examples on the, on the DVD. Uh, and I'm still, I've still got some of these that I'm working on. Um, so just a couple of acknowledgements. W2 AAU for the inspiration to try. These guys have all helped help me with devices and advice and things. The man, the man with the very high power VHF amps, Chris Bartram, Sam and Bernie. Um, Doug wrote the appendix for the ILAM, which, which is on the paper, G4DZU. Quux, I will absolutely add to Charlie... If anybody knows how to make Quux optimized, can they let me know? Because I don't know either, before you ask. But Quux is a freeware software, and it's extremely good. Then Philip Hagar-Smith and his wonderful chart. Um, even if you don't understand how it works, learn how to use one. And this is just an example of how boring he probably was as an engineer. When asked why he invented the chart, he said, from the time I could operate a slide rule... I've been interested in graphical representations of mathematical relationships. Now, you, you would have thought you could say something better, wouldn't you? Okay, thank you. That's it. <laughs>